Hello. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really, really honored to be a part of this fellowship and just so excited to be a part of this cohort. So thank you. Thank you for coming today and for, for having me here. Um, so I have been for the last 18 years in New Orleans and for the last six years uh, on this particular site, this farm called Grodat Youth Farm. The name was selected uh, one month after the 2010 Saint Super Bowl victory. So. <laughs> It sometimes doesn't have a lot of translation outside of the city, but that's the origin. Um, and and so this is really where I've done the last bit of my work. But for the for the previous 12 years, I've been working at the intersection of food, education, and community redevelopment in New Orleans. Um, so I'll talk. I'm going to talk today particularly about this project. Um, so the beginning of this story started more in a place that looks like this. I was a high school teacher before the hurricane and uh, in a windowless cl classroom, not this particular one, but something like that, and quickly became dissatisfied with the limitations of the classroom as a physical space and the limitations of a test-based approach to, to education in order to actually engage my students in the kind of learning that I thought was really essential for them. Um, and at the same time, I was spending a lot of time riding around and seeing places like this in New Orleans. There's now even more land like this, vacant land in the city, um, than there was before, but it's always been a, a part of the, the city landscape. And um, while I was seeing a lot of, of blighted property or open space in the city, what I wasn't seeing when I would go into uh, grocery stores was a lot of produce, and particularly local produce. There was just very, very little local produce being sold in the neighborhood or in the city. Um, and so I started to think about these two challenges and the market opportunity of using some of this land um, as a place for local food production and engaging young people in that process. Another thing that I saw as a teacher was that a lot of my students needed to make money to financially contribute to their households, but most of the job opportunities within their neighborhoods were in fast food r restaurants. And it, it, had an under, it undermined their educational experience because they'd often have to be at work really late. So I started thinking about an alternative way to engage young people as paid as paid employees in the food system. Um, and I thought that a farm could become a platform for the kind of social, um, emotional, and ecological intelligence that I feel like is what was missing from, from the classroom. So uh, then a couple years later, this happened. Obviously, we're seeing so many of these images again now. And um, I began the process of working on kind of just pitching in with the long and arduous redevelopment of the city. And uh, that brought me back to Tulane, where I had graduated from, and the School of Architecture. I'm not an architect, but um, it brought me to the School of Architecture there and a group called the Tulane City Center. And um, so the work we, we engaged in in the first couple years was really about um, just trying to help. Um, there, was, there was a really big interest in food production after the storm, because people, for the first time in their lives, had experienced not having access to food. And I think it really changed the way people thought about food and about like how little control we have over the global food system that we're a part of. So um, the first kind of the first type of project that I engaged in in that landscape was um, helping to start a series of neighborhood gardens, backyard gardens, and community gardens. And so the organization that I worked for would provide like the resources and the training, and um, the Tulane City Center would do small design build projects like this. They'd put in garden beds and um, tool sheds, rainwater catchment. Uh, things. And so this became kind of a way for us to test out working together. And so in this process, I got interested again in this idea of a bigger market scale operation. Another thing that I was noticing in New Orleans post-Katrina was the rate with which neighborhoods were able to kind of redevelop. And I felt like there were basically two, two um, Two factors. The first is just financial capital. People who had money could immediately begin rebuilding their house. Um, and the other was social capital. So there were some neighborhoods where there wasn't necessarily um, a lot of money, but people were able to work together so they could participate in community planning processes more effectively and leverage resources that were being poured into the city. And so what that made me think was that in a world in which disaster is going to become more and more common, it's essential that we begin to think about how we build social capital and social cohesion. And one of the things that's true about New Orleans is that we don't live 
integrated in, in many ways. Th these neighborhoods in dark purple here are neighborhoods that are um, greater than 40% of the poverty rate. And the poverty rate is very, you know, the, the number that they use for that is a very small number. Um, these neighborhoods are also predominantly, uh oh, African American. And, um, and neighborhoods that you see in light purple are, um, are really almost exclusively white. And so I felt that the mission of this kind of educational space needed to also include a focus on bringing young people together across differences, particularly race and class, which may seem very basic in this landscape, but in New Orleans um, is, not, is not totally commonplace. So the challenge there was thinking about like where, what feels like everyone's space. Um, because in New Orleans, it's very easy to look at a place and be like, that's a place for black people or that's a place for white people. And there still aren't that many places that I think truly feel like integrated spaces. Um, and City Park, which you see in the middle here, I think is one of those spaces. There is a history of exclusion and, and uh, discrimination within the park's practices, definitely. But post-Katrina, the park became almost more like wilderness than the city. And so it felt like a really good kind of neutral territory to bring young people together from different backgrounds. So um, we were given a, a site within the, the park. This park is bigger than Central Park. Um, and we were granted seven acres of land on a former golf course. So before the storm, there were actually four golf courses in this one park. <laughs> so you can imagine there were about 13 people using the park. It was great. Um, and the park, I think, was really open to um, actually re con reconceiving itself. I mean, it was, you saw, you saw in that picture, it was completely inundated with water. So it was destroyed in many ways. And under the park's leadership, they, um, they were really wanting to think about how to, to make the space more inclusive. So we were just lucky, and we got, we got there at the right time. Um, so I'm going to walk you through, since many of you are architects, a little bit of the design process for our campus, which uh, really centered on reusing materials and um, restoring the landscape. So the first step actually was removing about a thousand Chinese tallows, which are highly invasive plants, and siting these shipping containers, and then building spaces around these retrofitted shipping containers. So um, the the spaces ha are areas for cold. There's a cold storage one of these is retrofitted into like a big cooler there's tool storage um, there's a post harvest handling area where we where we prep produce um, and then within an eco camp the eco that kind of outdoor classroom we have a teaching kitchen so that young people can be learning how to prepare the foods that they're taking home with them um, a tiny office space <laughs> that is something I would try to rethink if I were to work with the architects again on this process um, and, and, and this is all centered around this outdoor classroom here, um, which I think is, is just a really dynamic space that we use for educational work, like classes, but also community events. We also were able to um, showcase some design features, sustainable design features that are not allowed within the city because um, City Park despite its name is actually state land. Um, and so we, could, we included composting toilets and gray water management within the design. And those are things, composting toilets are not actually allowed within the city. So it became an opportunity to showcase some of the, the design features, um, sustainable design features. Um, as the campus was being built, we were busy transforming this former golf course into productive farmland, which is a... Um, it's a time intensive process that really requires a lot of soil building. Um, our <laughs> oh man, our first planting, for our first day, we planted a thousand Swiss chard plants. And within 72 hours, 75% of them had been destroyed by cutworms that were living in the soil, which was a humbling and, and good, you know, really grounding start to the project. Um, and so what we realized was that we needed to really concentrate on soil development. And um, we did that by, a, a lot of that was done through amendment of um, 
the soil by, we, we looked to see what are the resources locally that we can use. Um, and we found coffee chaff from the Folgers plant. There's, we use composted horse manure from the police stables in the park. And so we would get these inputs brought to the farm. You can see them in the lower right hand corner. Um, and we turn those into the soil. And then up in the upper right hand corner, you see green areas that are cover cropped. So sometimes that's done to create aeration in the soil, sometimes it's done to add nitrogen, but all of it takes a lot of time. Um, and so it took us uh, several years to grow into about a full two acres of land on this site. But the result and the, and the time and effort that we put into it has been a, a highly productive um, landscape where we're, we're really competitive in terms of the amount of food that we're selling and I'm sorry, the amount of food we're harvesting and the amount of money we're making off of that produce to farms relative to us. And this was really important to me. It was really important to me that we started a farm model that was um, competitive financially with other similar farms because I wanted people to see um, a production model, not just like a, a gardening space in the city. So, um, I think it's interesting to consider what the real potentials and limitations are for urban agriculture and for this particular model. Um, I have definitely, this was a little bit ago when, when urban agriculture was just everywhere, it, it became a kind of panacea in many conversations for blight, for you know, a lack of food in, in low-income communities, and I think that actually does a disservice to urban agriculture because I don't think it can fix all of those problems. Um, we harvest about 25,000 pounds of food a year on, on two acres, so you can grow a fair amount of food in, in a small space, but you know, relative to the consumption demands of a city, that's still a drop in the bucket. Um, there are some cities that are really pushing the envelope in terms of how much food they're growing for the community, but it's still a tiny percent. So, for example, in Detroit, 5% of everything uh, consumed is grown within the city limits, so truly urban agriculture. But that is obviously a very specific condition, and um, I think the reasons why people are growing food is a lot out of a need to be able to grow food for themselves. So I think what's more interesting to explore from my perspective or a, p a greater potential impact of urban agriculture is educational. Um, our farm has created a place where young people who have grown up inside of a city connect with food through the, the actual, as farmers, growing the food themselves, and more broadly connect with nature. Um, on, within our space. Um, there's an alligator that lives in this bayou right next to us, which is always exciting to see. There are turtles, there's birds. We're actually located in a very important migratory pathway um, for birds because we're all along the Mississippi River and then City Park is a very big green space in an urban environment. So the biodiversity is, is really uh, impressive. Um, and I think a farm in the city also has the ability to spark the realization that food does not come from the grocery store, which again may sound pedantic, but is not. <laughs> because um, so many people, so many generations of people, I think at this point in our country have grown up just not really thinking about the ever lifting the veil behind, um, behind how food is grown, who grows the food, what the impact of how that food is grown is on the, on the, the people who grow it or the land. I mean, I think there is really a, a conversation about this nationally now, but it's different to experience it. It's one thing to talk about it, and it's very different, I think, to do it. Um, at GrowDat, we use the work of running the farm as a platform for skill building, learning, and relationship development through meaningful work. We've developed an ecosystem approach to leadership development based upon three factors. Young people being engaged in real work, um, young people learning how to give and receive feedback through a consistent communication tool that we call Real Talk. This is really an essential component of our work because uh, what we are trying to do is help young people not necessarily build hard skills related to farming, but build skills that are going to be transferable to every, every situation in their lives. Um, and third, through a values-based standard system that um, incentivizes behavioral change. Um, so the farm is a great platform for this because we can have conversations with each other about um, performance and about how we're doing based upon the fact that we're working together. Um, our tiered leadership 
model moves young people from mentee to mentor. You see here Asia Vinay, who is actually now on staff with us. So young, when, when youth enter the leadership program, they're in small groups called crews. Each of those are led by a crew leader, which is uh, an alumni of the program. Um, and then also from, from student to teacher. So a lot of what we see within our work is the opportunity to flip the script around who are environmentalists, um, who are farmers, so that um, we can cut through some of the, um, the way that I think food and the food movement is really seen as an elitist white movement. And um, this becomes a way for young people to practice skills and then use those skills to educate a broader community. I think that one thing I really appreciate about this as an educational model is that young people are exploring this, a system. They're coming to understand the history of our particular food system and how it got to be that way, and at the same time, actively participating in a triple bottom line business and understanding the complexity of that, right? So it's not just analyzing something without engaging with the, in, in the realities of what it means to um, to have a food system that does, in many ways, function well in meeting our needs, but then in other ways does not. Um, one other way I think urban agriculture can be very valuable is in creating spaces to test and model small-scale solution, solutions to lack of access to fresh food. So we um, have always committed to donating 30% of our harvest or sharing it. And through that, we can test models like the Vegetable Prescription Program, which has been really successful nationally. That's a program where doctors actually prescribe fruits and vegetables to people suffering from diet-related diseases, and the research has shown that it's very effective. So we've partnered with a clinic. Um, they refer their patients to our farm, and then we give them a discounted price on, um, on the produce. And, and then in that way, we can also um, do research, partner with universities to do research, and then push for those kind of policy changes to be adopted more broadly within the city. Lastly, and, and not least, is uh, one thing I've really seen at Grota is that it has grown into um, a, a space, a community space, in which people are talking and thinking about and eating food <laughs> and growing food. And the conversations of this community center on ways to work together to make incremental changes that push our food system in a direction that is regenerative rather than destructive and that produces food that nourishes rather than makes us sick. And young people are at the front of this work and conversation at Grow Dat, which I think gives adults the, the chance to really recognize their capacity. Simultaneously, I think a model like this, which there are many around the country, can give us the space to question the capacity for urban agriculture to be spaces for education, particularly teenagers, while generating food. So um, while I'm here, I am really interested to explore this idea of land-based education. Um, to go back to the original windowless classroom that I showed you, um, I think that this idea of connecting young people to land in a meaningful way is essential right now. We are uh, facing so many dire environmental challenges at a time when people are more and more retreating into a reality of technology. And I think that we miss a lot of what's happening, and we really need to be paying attention right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested to think both about how public land, how we can think about public land and public parks as places potentially for a kind of community-based or educational food production. Um, Grodat is, is likely to double in size in the coming year, which will make it possibly the largest um, farm of its kind in um, a park in the country. Um, and also to think about the meaning of education at this moment and how connecting young adults to one another and to land, I think, is an essential part of, of the educational experience they need. Thank you. <laughs>